This week, I wrapped up a book study on Blessed Are the Crazy, Breaking the Silence About Mental Illness, Family, and Church by the Reverend Dr. Sarah Griffith Lund. Sarah is known by many of you as she served Plymouth, now almost 20 years ago, as one of our Lilly Ministers for Outreach. Sarah frames this book about the self-empowerment and healing found in the courage to tell our own story and how in the telling of our stories, we offer the gift of transformation to others who may find encouragement within their own lives due to the revelations of another's experience. I'm so grateful to those who gathered with me these past Thursday mornings as they boldly offered pieces of their own stories. We marveled together in the grace-filled way Sarah relates her experience with mental illness in her family, as well as the success and the failings of the church along the way. Part of our conversations centered in Plymouth's offerings for mental health ministry and our great need to bring people together for support and sustenance as each of us walks our individual narratives of life, faith, and health. Some wonderful ideas brewed within each conversation, and I look forward to helping bring some of those ideas to life as we as a spiritual community seek ways to be open inclusive, caring, and comforting to all. While there is tremendous gift in the telling of our own stories, what happens when our story gets told for us and our point of view is inaccurate or non-existent? Suddenly, who we are is scrutinized unfairly and grave assumptions made that too often damage rather than exalt. As I wrestled with scripture text this week, not so silently lamenting that I had definitely drawn the short straw in the preaching schedule, the prevalent feeling brewing in me has been anger. Anger at all the excuses and justification we have made for and about David and the blatant discounting of Bathsheba and Uriah who were pawns in David's dangerous, unscrupulous game. The story of Bathsheba, Uriah, and David is one of arrogant and violent abuse of power reminiscent of too many contemporary examples where accountability is scarce. David's actions are contemptible. In a time when kings went to battle with their troops, David stays in the luxury of his palace. Following an afternoon nap, he spies on Bathsheba, who is following the rules of her tradition and taking a purifying bath following menstruation. David inquires as to who this woman is, and even after learning she is the wife of one of his army commanders, he insists on having Bathsheba brought to him so he can have sex with her. She becomes pregnant, and David develops a plot to bring Uriah home from battle so that he could sleep with his wife, thus covering up David's paternity. Granting Uriah some R&R does not work. Uriah won't leave his soldiers to enjoy the comforts of his home or his wife's bed. So David plies Uriah with alcohol, again trying to coerce him into going home and, quote-unquote, washing his feet, which is a biblical euphemism for sex. And even under heavy alcohol influence, Uriah remains loyal to his soldiers and camps out with them. David, desperate and despicable, instructs his general Joab to place Uriah on the front lines of battle, ensuring Uriah's death. And while our scripture text ends before we know what happens next, I will tell you now that David's evil plan works and Uriah is killed. Theological and artistic interpreters have often looked for ways to soften David's guilt. 
And this has been achieved by various strategies, shifting the blame to Bathsheba as a seductress, suggesting that there were mitigating circumstances for David's actions, romanticizing the narrative as a great love story, offering up David as just a good old boy who predictably succumbed to temptation. As early as 1951, Hollywood took their turn with this text by producing the movie David and Bathsheba with Gregory Peck and Susan Hayward. Why do we do this? Why do we add our own narr narrative so as to co-opt the words on the page that only illuminate David's abuse of power, potential rape, or at the very least sexual coercion, a disregard of responsibility, and a plot to murder? Yes, this is the same man who is described in the book of Acts as a man after God's own heart. Scholars and other reputable biblical writers have justified this particular chapter in David's story by discounting it completely or suggesting that its meaning is that God has great purpose for even those who are deeply flawed and that these atrocious acts do not define David's true character. Really? Isn't that what we still do? When someone with political or societal power does something heinous, rather than hold them accountable, we look the other way, we ignore the truth, and we make excuses for the abominable behavior, disqualifying the abuse from one's effectiveness in office or other powerful roles. If anything, this text calls us to take a hard look at David, confront his sin, and stop blaming the victims. The writer of this text attaches no blame to Bathsheba. We have done that. We have been taught that the fall of David is Bathsheba's fault. Just as history has always blamed the woman for sexual harassment and violence, she was seductive in her bathing. She wore suggestive clothing. She shouldn't take his attention and advances so seriously. Can't she take a joke? He was only trying to flatter her. Oh, it was a long time ago. I'm sure he learned from his mistakes. Boys will be boys. If we are still using any of those adages to let David or anyone off the hook, we need to stop it. Just stop it. I was appalled this week as I listened to a podcast I have come to trust and appreciate on the Revised Common Lectionary from which this text comes. When the two male preachers guffawed over David's inability to control his lust for Bathsheba, it was that second look at a beautiful woman, one of the commenters said, that got David into a whole lot of hot water. And then they both laughed. Is it really easier to laugh in the face of violence than to confront it? Many who read this text, like David, have the luxury of ignoring their privileged position in the world and the ways that we commodify and objectify people. At this moment in time, those of us of dominant culture are being called and challenged to check our privilege, to be incredibly mindful of the ways we have received what we do not deserve because of the color of our skin. This privilege has allowed the continuing mistreatment of people of color, and this privilege extends to our historical legacy of excusing the sins of powerful white men, especially around sexual violence, power, and greed. If we are to be pursuers of justice, we must hold one another accountable so as to stop making excuses, stop being silent and start believing that the abuse of power is a deadly sin. While there is something to be said for the biblical canon, including this chapter of David's story, it is, as one commentator wrote, told 
with the power of understatement. The reality of David's sin lies in these verses. But we have to be willing to acknowledge it and dwell with David's reality before rushing to make excuses for his behavior or commending him to God for, com for forgiveness. When I approach a scripture passage for preaching, I always ask these two questions. Where is God in this text? And what is the good news here? And sometimes, like with today's pericope, those questions keep me awake at night. David is in complete control in this scripture. Nothing is left to chance. This David is contemptuous and unremorseful. This story is one of abuse of both person and power. Where is God in the midst of this text? Not with David, for the God in whom I believe would not align with nor condone the rape of a woman or the murder of an innocent man. God is with Bathsheba and Uriah, suffering with them as they are both manipulated and harmed. This may provide little comfort to us as we grapple with God's lack of intervention and inability to prevent the course of violence. Yet in our most vulnerable moments, when we acknowledge that God grieves when we grieve, that presence can be our saving grace. Bathsheba did not hide her pregnancy from David. She confronted him with the consequence of his actions. Uriah remained loyal to his troops in spite of the king's coercion. These are godly attributes worth lifting up in this difficult story. What about the good news? I struggle to find any here. Lessons from this story include that of accountability. When one is not held accountable, it often leads to greater deceit and deepens complicity that will harm even more people. From this text, we are called to stop blaming victims and to develop better ways to protect our communities against abuses of power and acts of violence. None of this feels like good news. Rather, it is a calling out of our own behaviors and our own excuses and our need for reparation for contemptible acts. This chapter of David's monarchy is also a reminder to tend carefully to those who have been violated at the hands of another. And I do apologize if any of my words today have caused pain to those who have lived through unimaginable trauma. As a community of faith, we must provide respite and comfort so as to be rebuilders of trust and create opportunities for healing love to work its repairing power. The seed of good news in the tragedy of these verses is that this is not the end of the story for David or for us. Next week, Duane preaches on what happens next, on the holy, hard work of repair, David, and we must experience if there is any possibility of redemption. Today, David's actions sit heavy upon our hearts, clamoring us to no longer ignore the sin. May God gentle us in this knowledge, and then... May God encourage us in our own redeeming. Amen.